The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance. The delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. From ourselves. Anytime you want to understand something, why is such and such happening? Why is there a biodiversity crisis? Or why are we drilling for more oil when it's polluting the atmosphere and causing oil spills? Why? And you ask why, and down a couple levels of why, you always get to money. All right, let's explore the thinking of Jacques Fresco and the society he'd like to see. The reason we emphasize machines and technology is to free man to pursue the higher things. Machines ought to do the filthy, repetitious, or the boring jobs. To save our environment, our stupidity, our conflict, we've got to reorganize our way of thinking and reconsider our social aims. We must put our mind to this as we do to put a man on the moon. One of the things I talk about is the sense of wrongness that I had as a child. Like I think most kids ha have some sense of it, that it's not supposed to be this way. You know, just for example, that you're not supposed to actually hate Monday and be happy when you don't have to go to school. Like, school should be something that you love. Life should be something that you love. Like many kids, uh, when I was six years old, I dreamed of flying in space. I'm old enough that back then, the only astronauts were Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. The Force Gods will blast them to pieces before they land. I went on and became a professional astronomer. I was lucky enough to get selected in the first group of shuttle astronauts. We trained for a long time, and of course, you go through many different types of simulators, but when you're actually sitting up there on the rocket, you realize that, hey, this is not the simulator. A whole vehicle is shaking a little bit on the pad. And then you hear this roar down beneath you, and the whole shuttle tilts forward a little bit. And then as it comes back to the vertical position, then all of a sudden, wham, the solid boosters ignite. And there's an incredible vibration and noise. And for the next two minutes, there is just so much power that you're sitting on top of. I was just sort of holding on, thinking to myself, whoa, I hope this whole thing holds together. And uh, sure enough, it did. Of course, by that time, looking out the window, the blue sky has already turned to the blackness of space. And I can see in the distance the coast of Africa coming up into view. And I always remember that feeling on my first flight when I realized, wow, you're in space. You see from orbit, the, the sun rises and sunsets 16 times every 24 hours. Flying over the Earth at night, in particular, gives you a real sense of human civilization. 
Because during the day, you look down and you see the colors of the earth, you see the forms of the landmass of, of the continents. There's a lot of beautiful things to see during the day. There's also the view of the impact that humans have had on our planet, and that can be pretty scary. Over the course of 11 years of flying, I watched as the Amazon jungle was continually being deforested. At night, you, you constantly see agricultural burning all over the world. So you could see harbors being silted up. You could see in Africa how the tree line would go up every year. And of course, we know about global warming and what we're doing to the atmosphere. That's the other thing that you, you really get a sense of from space is how thin our atmosphere is. Basically, the idea that we're seeing this environmental damage on the Earth created by humans, but we see it from a cosmic perspective, means that it's just not something that we can ignore. The planet is responding to the presence of, of humanity. For the first time, we have the capability, the technology, and the knowledge to achieve a global society of abundance for all. We cannot continue as we are, or the consequences will surely be dire. A 2012 UN report states that a global population growth from 7 billion to almost 9 billion is expected by 2040. Demands for resources will rise exponentially. By 2030, requirements for food are projected to rise by 50%, energy by 45%, and water by 30 percent. We are presently depleting natural resources 50 percent faster than their planet can renew. At this rate, it is estimated that we'll need three more planet Earths to keep up with resource needs as they are today. What is the sixth extinction? Is it happening right now? What's the cause of it? What we as human beings are, are doing to the planet, changing the basic conditions of life very dramatically and very rapidly. And yet, from environmental disaster to war, our obsolete value systems perpetuate insanity, threatening us on many fronts. Is it the best we can do to just clean up after the fact? Are politicians capable or even competent to manage the world around us? The Prime Minister. Are we simply incapable of anticipating and planning for our future? Are we innately flawed in ways we can't change? Why not just use firing squad? We often hear that human nature is fixed. It's only human nature. And our worst qualities are inborn. How are they going to stop being criminals? Oh, nonsense. They were born that way and there's no use trying to change them. But clearly in humans, learning plays the major role. In fact, I, I refer to humans as the learning animal because humans learn more than any other animal. And yet, considering our history of aggression, warlike tendencies, jealousies and hatred, we still have much to learn. One would think it impossible to simply overlook the conditions we're immersed in. The culture doesn't know any better. They don't know what forces are involved in shaping human behavior. Therefore, they invent their own concept and project their own values into human behavior and say that's human nature. That's where they're wrong. Right now, we have an explosion of technologies in our culture. And I think many people think that technology is going to save us. Certainly, technology has made our lives easier in many respects. Find parking space. Parking space found. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Drones armed with Hellfire missiles. How would you like to get paid to spy 
on your neighbors. But there's one technology that we don't have that we, that we sorely need if we're going to really change, and that's a technology of behavior. And so the science of behavior needs to be applied like the sciences of physics, chemistry, and biology have been. That's the one missing, you know, ingredient in, in our culture. And, um, and that's the toughest one because it opposes the way that most people think about themselves. Examining human behavior in the same manner as any other physical phenomenon will enable us to understand the factors responsible for shaping our attitudes and our conduct. All natural scientists assume that their subject matters uh, are lawful and orderly. I mean, if they're not, then you can't do science. Behavioral scientists assume that human behavior and the behavior of other organisms is also lawful and orderly. To not assume that means that you accept that human behavior is somehow separate from the rest of nature. We don't make that assumption. We make the assumption that human behavior is part of nature. Human behavior is just as lawful as everything else. The sunflower does not turn to the sun. The sun makes it turn by pulling in membranes. A sailboat cannot sail. The wind moves it. Plants can't grow. They are shoved by sunshine, soil, temperature, all kinds of things. All things are shoved by something else. All people are acted upon by other things. Remember, your mother said cup, table, light, papa, mama, over and over again until you did the same thing. Even race hatred is learned. Awakened as the ideals of intolerance and racial superiority are taught to succeeding generations. You can be brought up to hate Afro-Americans. You can be brought up to hate Jews, Swedes, all kinds of people. I hate Filipinos. I hate Mexicans. I hate them all. We can raise a Jewish boy in a Nazi culture and becomes a good Nazi. Yeah, I talk a lot about the story of self that every culture has, and it answers the question, what are you? What is it to be human? So it says that you're this separate being among other separate beings in a universe that is separate from yourself as well. Like you're not me, that plant is not me, that's something separate. And this story of self really creates our world. If you're a separate self and there's other separate selves out there and other species out there, and the universe is fundamentally indifferent to you uh, or even hostile, then you definitely want to control. You want to be able to have power over other beings and over these whimsical, arbitrary forces of nature that, that could extinguish you at any time. This story is becoming obsolete. It's becoming no longer true. We don't resonate with it anymore. And it's actually generating crises that are insoluble from the methods of control. And that's what's clearing space, clearing the space for us to step into a new story of self and a new story of the people. A human being is part of the whole called by us universe a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and his feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Albert Einstein. Mechanical processes are based upon many interacting systems. What you got there, son? A plane. What makes it fly? Is it the propeller? Well, the propeller's not going to turn unless you have the motor, right? So, it's the motor? But the motor needs fuel. So I'm guessing it's the fuel that makes it fly. Almost, but if you don't have the spark plugs and the oxygen, the fuel's not going to burn. So it's spark plugs and oxygen? Well, you would think so, but actually, even with all that working, if you don't have the wings 
and the control surfaces to give it lift, it'll never get off the ground. So it's the wings and control surfaces that make it fly? Actually, it's all the above, son. It's a complicated machine, so it needs all these things working together to make the plane fly. That's a lot like other technologies and even human behavior. So it's all those things that make it fly. Exactly, kiddo. And whose fault is it? It's not the Democrats' fault. And it's all Obama's fault. <laughs> we don't come to our own conclusions without any outside influences. We don't change our minds. Our minds are changed by events. Heard about them, right, brothers? No. They say they want to build themselves a flying machine. They ain't never going to be no flying machine. If God wanted them to fly, he would give them wings. Yeah. <laughs> Our minds are changed by events. I changed my mind. Yeah, me too. If you're born with a brain that's more effective, faster than the average brain, you become a fascist faster if you're brought up in a fascist environment. A good brain cannot describe that which is significant. A brain has no mechanism of discrimination. Only experimental evidence determines that. If the surroundings that establish our values remain unaltered, in spite of the urgings of poets, priests, and politicians, the same behavior and values will persist. If you tell people that you're not the fish in a certain area, if you don't provide food for those people and the means of living, they will violate those laws. All laws have to coincide with the nature of the physical world. But it isn't the law that prevents crime. It's if you meet the conditions. These days, rhino poachers come by helicopter armed with powerful tranquilizers and a chainsaw. Rhino horn is now worth more than gold. If people are unemployed, they will do whatever they have to do to feed their family. So if you make a law and say that you're not to steal food, they will steal food if that serves their family needs. Any law that's made by man that doesn't fit the circumstances of reality will be violated. Higher ideals and aspirations that people hope for can't be realized when there is deprivation and war. If you want to go bomb somebody, there's remarkably little discussion about how much it might cost. But when you have a discussion about whether or not we can assist people who are suffering, then suddenly we become very you know, cost conscious. No culture evaluates human behavior in this way. If they did, they would question, what is it that generates greed, bigotry, inequities, and war? They bring you up with the values that put them in power. Unfortunately, all societies to date have indoctrinated people toward values that perpetuate those in power. So, let's investigate the key factors governing the lives of people and nations. Money and the values, behaviors, and consequences it produces. Time and sales data. Split second stats. As a remnant of antiquity, money now largely serves as a mechanism of corruption, deprivation, and control in the hands of a few. It's corrupted everything. I mean, every institution that we live in is corrupted by money. It, what's fascinating to me is that we can become enslaved by something that we've created. Not physically, but just mentally enslaved by a notion that was invented by humanity. You know, it is archaic because I think we've grown past what money can do. It is well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and money system. Or if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Henry Ford, 
Ford Motor Company. Well, money's an agreement. You know, it doesn't have value all by itself. It has value because people agree that it has value. Economists will tell you what money does. It facilitates exchange. You use it to count things and keep track of things. You now you write some numbers on a magical piece of paper called a check, and you can cause all kinds of abundant goods to come to your house. I mean, you can even cause misery for thousands of people if you are one of the highest initiates of the magic of money. In a desperate attempt to survive, many work multiple jobs. They may steal, lie, or embezzle. So stress-producing to the average person. Worries about rent, losing their job, can't pay off the house. On a bigger scale, the profit motive creates a ruthless cycle of devastation. Illness, pollution, and war are accepted as normal. You have sort of a wartime economy that, that, that begins to be self-perpetuating, and you have powerful people in, inside of a, a power vacuum, really, you know, who, who see it as in their interest to perpetuate the conflict. But it does benefit the few at the top who live parasitically by the manipulation and control of money. The banking system right now is effectively enslaving individuals, enslaving students, enslaving institutions, and sucking resources from them. They set it up so that there would be private central banks that could charge everybody interest on the currency and allow themselves to get rich without having to do anything. Who's been doing all of this? It's a group of bankers, uh, the Federal Reserve System. That's a private system. The Fed is a private bank owned by private stockholders. Do not let the name Federal fool you. In 1913, which is when Woodrow Wilson allowed the Federal Reserve System legislation to be passed, most of the Congress people had gone home. This legislation turned the central bank system of the United States over to the Federal Reserve Board, making them the only group that could issue Federal Reserve notes or U.S. dollars. President Wilson, he regretted that. He said that he had just sold this country downstream. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. A government by the opinion and the duress of small groups of dominant men. President Woodrow Wilson, 1916. It's a fiat system that we operate under and it's actually someone punching numbers on a computer somewhere. That is how we manufacture money today. There's nothing backing it. There's nothing behind it. When government spends more than it collects in taxes and needs money, it does not print its own money, but borrows from the Federal Reserve in exchange for U.S. bonds, which the Fed provides at interest. When people and corporations want money, they go to banks as well. The system is rigged. If a bank buys a $100 bond, the bank gets to lend out 10 times that amount or $1,000 they created the extra funds from nothing. No money, gold, or anything to back it up. The bank also gets back the loans with interest for all the money lent. Money is created this way from the simple signature of a borrower with the promise to pay it back. And to make matters worse, very often people are paying the amount back many times over due to the interest. This is the process by which individuals, companies, and governments acquire money. It is respectably referred to as fractional reserve lending and is used globally by most other banking systems, keeping people and entire nations in perpetual debt. Scarcity is built into the money system. On the most obvious level, it's because of the way money is created as interest-bearing debt. So anytime a bank lends money into existence or the Federal Reserve creates money, the money comes along with a corresponding amount of debt. And the debt, because there's interest on it, is always greater than the amount of money. So it essentially throws people into competition with each other for never enough money. Growth is another thing that's built into our money system. 
If you're a bank, you're gonna lend to the person who's gonna create new goods and services so they can profit and they can pay you back. You're not gonna lend to somebody who doesn't create goods and services. So money goes toward those who will create even more of it. But basically economic growth means that you have to find something that was once nature and make it into a good or was once a gift relationship and make it into a service. You have to find something that people once got for free or did for themselves or for each other and then take it away and sell it back to them somehow. By turning things into commodities, we get cut off from nature in the same way as we're cut off from community. We look at nature with, with eyes of it's just a bunch of stuff. And that leaves us very lonely and leaves us with, with many basic human needs that go unmet. And if you have money, you might try to fulfill this hunger through purchasing, through buying things, or through accumulating money itself. And of course, now we're, we're nearing the end of, of growth. We, the planet can't sustain much more growth. And that's why the crisis that we have today won't go away. So if you just keep printing dollars with no backing, at a certain point, people lose confidence in the currency. And that's what's happened. The banking system right now is in the business of manufacturing risk by creating debt for individuals and people. And so there is the risk that those people will not pay that debt back. But the liabilities for the risk have been and continue to be assigned to the U.S. taxpayer in the U.S. currency. We're now sitting in a situation where the world's currencies are about to crash. Nobody knows how long it's going to take, but the Federal Reserve System has been printing dollars like there's no tomorrow. You have a, what is effectively a criminal enterprise based on the manipulation of people's attention, resources, and time in order to extract value from them. They're stealing money from us that way. They're stealing the result of our efforts and our labor. And that is something that has grown uh, as, a, as a cancer on our society. These bankers uh, are all part of a, a system called the Bank for International Settlements. Most people, even in business and banking, don't understand this bank and its role as, as the BIS. They own 40% of the assets of the 43,000 companies that are traded on the capital markets. The bank runs itself. It has a board of directors which is composed of 15 governors of central banks from around the world. And they pull down 60% of the annual earnings. They bought up all our media, and that media is hoodwinking citizens. The media has morphed into just uh, peddling the corporate interests of the money masters that control the political establishment. There's about 118 boards of directors that sit on these five giant media corporations. And they all serve different boards of Monsanto to weapons, to food. So when you have all these interests bleeding together, it's that much harder to differentiate what interests you're seeing laid out in the mainstream media. Fair balance. If you want to understand power, you have to understand who nominates candidates, not understand who votes for candidates. Our system is not a democracy. The percentage of our population that participates in the nomination process is literally less than 5% of the population. And really, less than 1% of the population. If I was in control of the nominating process of everything that everybody ate, and I always nominated cheeseburgers or fried chicken, and I told you that it was a democracy and you could eat anything you want, as long as it was a cheeseburger or fried chicken. Would that be a democracy? I could sell it to you as a democracy because I don't decide whether you eat cheeseburgers or fried chicken. You get to vote in a very large and well-publicized election as to whether we're going with fried chicken or cheeseburgers. And people organize into very tribal groups, be very anti-fried chicken and very pro-cheeseburger, or they'll explain to you exactly why cheeseburgers are gonna be the end of the world and why fried chicken's gonna save you. Those who can afford it hire lobbyists who essentially buy politicians. Most of the time, either party will suit their needs. Definition of a lobbyist in the United States is someone who advocates for someone else and is getting paid for it. The laws then enacted are quite often written by the corporations to benefit themselves. 
Professor Thurber sees an underground explosion in lobbying and estimates the industry actually brings in more than $9 billion a year, exceeded only by tourism and government. The reason that we aren't changing things right now is the banks have lobbyists in Washington in numbers I've never seen. Lobbyists are strictly there to buy access. They are not there to enhance the democratic process. Families and working people just don't have that kind of representation, power, or influence to look after their needs. They've designed the system uh, to reinforce and, in a sense, uh, finance themselves based off of special interests. Everything that was around in 2007, 2008, that we get so scared about, the mortgage-backed securities, the credit default swaps, the other derivatives, they still exist. They absolutely do. And yes, there's higher capital requirements for the banks, so they can't be as leveraged, but those are not that high. And if we don't have a media that's providing who's really like writing these bills and passing this legislation and what it's all for and who it serves, then we're living in a false, we're living in an illusion. Well, I think that generally the laws in this country are written by the wealthy and the powerful because I mean, I think by definition, that's who controls the legislatures and the commanding heights of uh, the power system in this country. And that's a scary reality because you can pay your way into having laws implemented that serve you and your corporation as, as you would like them to serve. The complete impunity that corporations have to operate unabated and pollute the entire planet. A major spill of toxic coal ash is raising questions again about the safety of water and the government regulators overseeing industry. There's zero accountability. I mean, other than slap on the wrist of a couple fines here and then. I mean, slave labor, to the exploitation of resources on the planet. The slap on the wrist of industries that pollute, cut corners, and violate policies will continue as long as it's profitable to do so. JP Morgan paid 13 billion in fines last year. If you have that much money in order to just pay fines, and they put away 19 billion for paying fines. JP Morgan is paying $410 million to settle charges with the government, but JP Morgan is not admitting any wrongdoing. Goldman Sachs settled early on in this case for $550 million without admitting wrongdoing. UBS has agreed to pay about $50 million under the terms of the settlement. UBS did not admit any wrongdoing. Well, I think that people commit the crimes that they're in a social position to commit. I, I think it was Bertolt Brecht that asked, which is a greater crime, to rob a bank or to own one? And I think as we've seen from everything from the savings and loan scandals to the Wall Street meltdown, it's that all too often the owners of the banks are frequently looting the institutions that employ them. Uh, they commit all manner of illegal acts, and yet they're very rarely prosecuted for them. And throughout history, there's been very little, I think, pretense that the government has always acted as an agent for the wealthy class. Yes, there might be idealistic politicians that got into the game to change the world, but if they're good, any good at their job, they're no longer changing the world. They're serving the interests of their donors if they want to rise in, in the world of politics. They say, write you congressman. Who the hell is this jackass that you have to write? He should be at the forefront of technology and knowledge. You don't have to write him. I'm sure most of you have flown in airliners. You don't have to write the pilot saying you're flying at an angle. Straighten out, God damn it! He knows his business, that's how he got the job. The people in Washington are lawyers and businessmen and can solve no problems. If the bottom line and it's a profit-driven world, then those interests are gonna be served first and everything is going to be secondary. And, and that's the sad reality of it. There is no value system that's put out there that is actually beneficial to humanity because it's based on consumerism and profit making. And we use artificial pumping in animals to make them grow faster. So if you can multiply the cells in the chicken faster, you, you can sell it sooner. But does that have an effect on the human body? They don't worry about that. They worry about the sale of chickens. Wealth is going to the rich faster than any other time in history. The success of the industrialized world has been dependent on the failure and the lack of development of the developing world. I mean, the reason that they're stifled is because they are indebted to the first world. We wouldn't be prospering if it weren't for 
the labor that's going on and the indentured servitude that's going on in the entire developing country. And so that's the power dynamic can never change in that respect because it's literally dependent on it being that way. The dirty and dangerous work done by children. The jobs down in the pits are typically reserved for teenagers with only tree limbs to brace the mine walls. The risk to them is real. Rich governments like to say they're helping poor countries develop. But who's developing who here? Each year, poor countries are paying about $600 billion in debt service to rich countries on loans that have already been paid off many times over. And then there's the money that poor countries lose from trade rules imposed by rich countries. Altogether, that's more than $2 trillion every year. Money systems have existed for centuries, and whether we realize it or not, have always been used to control behavior by limiting the purchasing power of the majority of people. One example of this is the criminal justice system. Many proclaim prisons don't work, but ultimately, prisons are a resounding success as a tool for social control to safeguard the political and economic established system. If you hire people whose only expertise is caging people to try to fix social problems, you're not going to get a very good solution. But I think that they're very good at caging people, and I think that's why mass incarceration has been a huge success for the ruling class in this country. The United States is really number one in a lot of things, and I think the biggest thing that we can say that we're number one in is how many people we lock up. And the United States has roughly 5% of the world's population, but we've got 25% of the world's prisoners. China has four times as many people as the United States does and half as many prisoners. The United States has more prisoners than the Soviet Union did at the height of uh, the purges and the collectivization in the 1930s and the infamous uh, Soviet Gulag. Poverty is a vicious cycle, rarely escaped by the poor. Studies found that scarcity can reduce mental capacity and cognitive performance. In children, it affects their brain development and memory. Additionally, the poor are often forced to live in areas of low air quality. Far from being a problem for only the poor, all areas of the socioeconomic spectrum suffer when our air, food, and water are polluted by fossil fuel emissions and radiation from nuclear accidents. The current energy infrastructure results in about two and a half to four million deaths per year worldwide uh, from respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and complications from asthma. We're in downtown Beijing, and the pollution readings have once again gone off the charts. Readings are around 25 times World Health Organization standards. Including 50 to 100,000 deaths per year in the United States, and 16,000 alone in California. The economic system that we're living in today is destroying the planet because it is based on an unsustainable model. We're seeing proof of that right now. The current energy infrastructure, uh, which has been going on for a long time, uh, has resulted in the accumulation of greenhouse gases and particles that cause warming of the Earth's climate. And the Earth's climate is warming at a rate faster than any time since deglaciation from the last ice age. In addition, uh, higher CO2 levels, CO2 is an acid, it dissolves in water, becomes carbonic acid, and it's resulted in the acidifications of the oceans, and this is destroying coral reefs. We have to realize our planet does have a certain amount of regenerative power, and there's no question that we've been through numerous worldwide extinctions. We have fossil records of that, and the Earth has recovered. There is a limiting carrying capacity, though. You know, we're, we're really playing a crazy game here with the atmosphere and the yeah. oceans. We're taking vast amounts of carbon from deep underground and putting this, putting this in the, in, the, in the atmosphere. This is crazy. We should not do this. There are many additional impacts of global warming. Sea level rise is a very big concern. For example, right now there is about 65 to 70 meters of sea level stored in ice, mostly in the Antarctic, but also in glaciers in Greenland and also sea ice in the Arctic and other places. 
the temperature's warm enough that we melt all this ice, that means the sea levels will rise 65 to 70 meters, and that will cover 7% of all the world's land and result in all this is along the coast where most people in the world live. This will cause a significant disaster. We're also seeing enhanced storminess, increased intensity of hurricanes, and greater extremes of weather associated with global warming. So there are significant problems associated with this, and these are all tied back to the emissions from coal, oil, and gas combustion that have been occurring since the Industrial Revolution that started in the uh, mid to late 1700s. It is probable that war itself could be our undoing, let alone the environment. Our brutal competitive behaviors are not human nature, but simply a result of scarcity, making us all competitors in the fight to attain what we need to survive. And while scarcity is naturally occurring, it's also intentional in industries and governments for profit and national interest. As long as nations are immersed in scarcity, we will continue to have conflicts between people. Crimes, murder, and other violence to all-out war, the ultimate expressions of human stupidity. The shook in the U.S. bombardment. Like, bomb the heck out of them. These behaviors must be surpassed if we wish to survive. The bombs on. That's the best recruiting tool for Al Qaeda. This guarantees the cycle of violence will go on. And with our technological ability to provide for all we must take steps towards a different approach. Or the endless cycle of booms, busts, and war will continue. Oh, no! Let me just say, no, Peace hey, in our time. Wait a minute, oh, a yeah, minute yeah. ago. Nobody, including the United, and most of all the United States, goes to war to liberate or spread democracy. The only incentive on a practical level to go to war is to acquire resources. In the United States case, it frequently is either energy resources, shall I say, supporting political alliances to preserve access to energy resources. Smedley Butler, a U.S. Marine Corps general major who was the most decorated Marine at the time of his death, stated it well when he wrote, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism, I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies. In China, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best that he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. War is a racket. It always has been. A few profit and the many pay. But there is a way to stop it. You can end it by disarmament conferences. It can be smashed effectively only by taking the profit out of war. Our universities today are better equipped than the best microscopes, the best scientific equipment. The bombs are getting worse. The wars are getting worse. Killing is getting worse. You don't need to kill people, bomb cities. There's something wrong with our culture, very wrong. To blame any individual or corporation does not get at the root causes of the problems. The structure of our socio-economic system itself has 
everyone out to meet their own needs, creating a predatory, competitive environment. Attempting to find solutions to the monumental problems within our present society will only serve as temporary patchwork, prolonging what is quickly becoming an obsolete system. <laughs>